Your Royal Highness, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, fellow, fellow Nuffield Scholars and uh, supporters, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to present my paper on uh, influencing agricultural policy. However, it will give me even greater pleasure to exit stage right in 12 minutes. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the NFU Mutual Charitable Trust for uh, funding this scholarship, which has been an absolutely fantastic opportunity, uh, and I'll go through other thanks later on. The red lines on the map show the various routes I went to, and I'll talk about that again in a few minutes. So first of all, by way of introduction, um, as already stated, I used to be a farmer in Herefordshire. Um, then I got involved in the National Farmers Union as a volunteer, and then eventually got offered a job in the southeast region. I went on to work at our head office, uh, doing crops and commodities, and then I ended up in the Westminster office in London. Uh, that isn't actually a picture of the Westminster office, it's a mobile unit which was outside the Westminster office uh, before anybody thinks we downsized a bit. In my spare time, um, I'm a keen runner, and uh, the other thing I do in my spare time is I'm a special in the Metropolitan Police. And uh, I'm based in Westminster, which is a really interesting borough to work on. Uh, we get to deal with the tourists, we get to deal with the um, drunken, disorderly people on a Friday, Saturday night. But like all boroughs, we do have some sort of uh, problematic residents in the area and there's one particular family uh, who regularly have uh, large-scale events, large-scale parties, lots of loud music going on. Um, in fact sometimes when they have their birthdays you even have to close the roads because that's <laughs> so problematic. Now, <laughs> before, before I go any further, um, I would just like to point out that I'm giving directions to a tourist <laughs> to Big Ben and not doing anything else in this photograph. <laughs> so, as I said, um, I went to a lot of countries on my travels and uh, I just wanted to uh, show it in a pictorial form rather than talking through it. Uh, it takes about one and a half minutes. Right, um, before I go any further, I just wanted to say that uh, a lot of the pictures weren't possible inside parliaments where I was working very, very hard, and that's why there's lots of outdoor pictures there of other venues. Right, um, so from my studies, um, I just want to pick out a few themes, but one of the main things was learning from other people uh, around travels, as all Nuffield scholars do. And sometimes it's learning what not to do. And what was absolute paramount uh, and obvious in places like Canada, the US, uh, Australia and New Zealand, was they've got a lot of single commodity groups, and they also have uh, groups which are based regionally and at national level, and they haven't got a unified message, and it just really brought out the importance of having a united voice. Now, we are quite fortunate in the UK in that we do have, uh, for example, the National Farmers Union, and I would say that because I work for them, but uh, in that we have a unified voice. But um, 
even even there this this week I've been uh, at the National Disease Control Centre at DEFRA dealing with bird flu and we've got the NFU at the table we've got the British Egg Industry Council and the British Poultry Council and there really has to be some form of uniting going on if we're going to have a single voice uh, to work against other people. The other thing that was interesting that I found was that in some countries where they've got a very supportive government, it makes lobbying less innovative uh, and less sharp. And I'm thinking of places like New Zealand and France and Japan, uh, for example. The next area I was looking at was, um, or picked up on, was on cultural differences. And we've got things like the European Union, which has got 60 languages within the 28 member states. Uh, that presents problems in getting a consensus amongst all those different people. Uh, we've seen that exemplified most recently in the CAP negotiations and CAP greening. What also I picked up elsewhere was the can-do attitude that you get in some countries. So places like Australia, Canada, Chile, New Zealand, they've got a real can-do attitude about how to support agriculture. And there's also a sense of teamwork in countries. Uh, places like Ireland, the Falklands, uh, Israel, New Zealand, they're working together for team agriculture. Uh, a very large part of the report uh, focuses on emotional lobbying. And emotional lobbying is a new form of lobbying. In fact, I don't think it's actually been defined yet, but I would define it as saying uh, it's lobbying which is long on emotion and short on science. And examples of that are things like badgers and TB. Uh, it's things like fracking. It's things like live exports or um, uh, lobbying to do with uh, genetic modification. And we need to counter that with hard scientific facts. And uh, finally, the final area would be political changes and political differences. So in places like uh, South America and Southeast Asia, lobbying's got a very uh, corrupt history to it, and that's starting to change, but it needs to be changed more. And other countries that I've visited, like Hungary and Cuba, uh, they're coming out of a communist regime, so they have a very different outlook. And then you've got places like Israel, which are very insular because of the lo geographical location that they're in, and they feel uh, threatened from all sides. And uh, as one of the lobbyists that I met in Tokyo said, globally we are all similar, the differences are in the techniques, and that, that became very apparent as I travelled around. So what's um, coming down the track? Well, I've already mentioned emotional lobbying, um, which, is, which is a very big issue. But there's also things like legislation. Uh, lobbying legislation has been brought in in various countries around the world, and generally all it's done is achieve more administration and uh, less good legislation because the people, the protagonists that should be at the table aren't there because they're blocked by the legislation. Now, fortunately, we fended it off till now in the UK, uh, but we need to be wary of it. Another thing that was very apparent in places like the US was financial uh, impact uh, upon representation. So um, it was shocking to find out that people from Congress in the states are now spending only two days a week in Washington because they're spending the rest of the week in their state fundraising for the next election, uh, which was quite shocking. And so hopefully we can resist that in the UK. But the final area uh, in what's coming our way is the whole social media mob rule and the mommy, the mommy or mommy blogs. And this is where Social media is playing an ever-increasing role in setting the agenda in politics. And we need uh, our own mob, as this uh, person quoted in Washington to me, to counter it. And farmers are well-placed because we've actually got sympathy and engagement and identity which other industries haven't. The person that told me this was from a manufacturing sector. But we have got that on our side, but we need to create the mob, um, our own mob, which is what one of my recommendations is. The next area is authenticity, and I was absolutely gobsmacked to arrive in Brasilia and be confronted by real-life, genuine uh, Amazonian tribal chiefs. And they weren't tourist chiefs, they were real chiefs, and they were demonstrating about land issues in Amazonia. And what had happened there was Greenpeace and Amazon Watch had flown them in to lobby the Brazilian government for their indigenous, indigenous rights. And rather than Greenpeace going to knock on the door of the Brazilian government and being told to go away because they were European lobbyists, they had facilitated for the genuine article, the genuine chiefs, to go there. Very effective tool. Um, this was also apparent in uh, the Falkland Islands, where the Falkland Islands students, after the age of 16, they study in the UK. So the Falkland Islands government is training them up to be ambassadors for the Falkland Islands, and they do talks in the UK. Now, 
that got me thinking, how can we transfer this into agriculture? Well, it's obvious, really. Uh, and as exemplified in the Lord Mayor's show this month, we're getting agricultural students to be the ambassadors for agriculture uh, in the UK. So my findings, really, most important one of all is to be there. And uh, as they say in Brussels, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's very apparent. And if you're not there, that vacuum will be filled by the nutter void, as, as, as I describe it. So we really need to have people everywhere. Anyway, I've got 33 different rules of lobbying, uh, golden rules of lobbying, that I've put together in the lobbying toolkit and various uh, ways of doing it, but that's, that's all in the report. Uh, as I've already said, it's important to have a united voice, to build on what we have with, and enhance them with modern techniques. Social media won't replace lobbying, but we can enhance it. Widen our membership, and uh, the area that I'm really looking at now is developing an online lobbying tool for farmers, so you can lobby from your mobile devices in the tractor cab, which is the most important thing to get our agricultural mob on side. And it's important to share skills and share knowledge. But most importantly of all, it's um, engaging that passion, getting agricultural evangelists out there to take on the emotional lobbying head on. So what have I gained from Nuffield? Well, all sorts of things. As John Stones very kindly said to me when I first started, he said, oh, Matt, you're a classic Nuffielder. You're in a midlife crisis. <laughs> And I said, am I? And, uh, and then I remembered that I just bought a convertible car uh, and booked a holiday to Ibiza. Um, now, I'm glad to say that I've, I've got over that and I've now got a very sensible Mini. Um, but uh, it's reinstated my uh, faith in humanity. Uh, going to places like Christchurch or Japan to see people getting over earthquakes is pretty uh, humbling stuff. Uh, but the fact that people have been so friendly and helpful all the way around and giving their time. Um, and uh, it's also meant in my career that um, I've been able to uh, gain a promotion at the NFU to look after government and parliamentary affairs. And in the police, I've been uh, made up to inspector in Westminster. But on a practical basis, rolling out the lobbying toolkit and uh, working on the tool and working on the general election manifesto for next year. And rather scarily, even being put into a lobbying book on, uh, which has gone into print. So, None of this would have been possible without the help of all the people that have given their time and effort, and I'd just like to thank them uh, very quickly now. Thank you for the day Those endless days, those sacred days you gave me I'm thinking of the day I won't forget a single day, believe me I bless the light I bless the light that lights on you, believe me And though you're gone You're with me every single day, believe me Days I remember all my life Days when you can't see wrong from right Then I knew that very soon you'd leave me But it's alright Now I'm not frightened of this world So to finish, um, I'd just like to say that this is basically what summarises the, the Nuffield experience for myself. If reaching the summit is only the final step of a long journey, then the people along the way may be as important as the peak, and an expedition to nowhere may have just become a modest journey to everywhere. Thank you very much, everybody.